weekly webinar, Dr. James, Dr. Mike, answering your most excellent YouTube questions. Mike, how's it going? Good. How are you, James? I'm okay, but the Mel's like family's over right now, so it's a little bit crazy. We got like double grandma madness. We got dog madness. It's a, it's a little At least bananas. There's more people paying attention to the dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Some guy tried to fight me uh, yesterday. That was interesting. What? Can you tell us that story? Dude, it was the strangest thing. I, so I went to the vet because the dogs were getting some of their like puppy shots. And I'm just sitting in the car like waiting for, because they're doing the COVID thing so you can't go in. So they come and get the dog and then go. So I'm waiting in the car. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. They asked me to bring a bag of poo. So I'm like, where's the poo? And I'm like looking for the poo. And I'm like, oh, I think I put it in the back. And I'm sitting with uh, Mel's uncle, Terry. He's just hanging out with me. And I go to the passenger side or the rear passenger of my car. And I hear somebody and they're like, yo, what the fuck is your problem, man? What the f He's like all worked up. And I'm like, well, clearly that's not pointed at me. I'm just here at the vet, like taking care of my dogs, right? So I'm just going about my business. And this guy walks up on me. And I'm like, oh, that was directed at me. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you pull your car all the way forward? He's like, just totally like whacked out of his mind. And I'm like, it's a street. I don't have to pull anywhere. I parked in front of the vet. Like, what's right. your problem? And he was like, fuck you, you bitch. Like all this, like, I don't want to hear it. You got to pull all the way up. Like he's just going bananas. And clearly he's like inebriated. Like I'm, I'm like piecemealing it together as I'm looking at him. He's just going nuts. And I look in front of my car to, to see like if there was even anywhere to go just to like deescalate. Cause like, you know, when someone's crazy, it's you're just better to avoid the whole situation. Right. So I look in front of my car and there's a fucking truck in front of my car. I can't even pull up any further if I wanted to. I look, I look at him. I'm like, dude, there's a car in front of me. Like, like what do you want? What do you want? And he's like, I don't want to hear it. Fuck you, you little bitch. Go back to where you came from. I don't want to hear any excuses. And he like storms off. And I like had a moment where I was like, am I going to kill this guy right now? Or... <laughs> and I, I was like, I look, I was like doing one of these, like, am I, and then I, my, like my, calm side kicked in was just like that guy is like first of all he's at the vet he's clearly inebriated he's like some combination of like inebriated and having a really bad day it's like what do you what is going to happen here right just de-escalate and move on and uh, that was basically the end of it and then the vet came out and was like hey i'm ready for your dogs so i was like do you see this crazy guy back here and he was like what i have no idea what you're talking about i was like never mind this guy's like messed out uh <laughs> he was like oh god yeah. Yeah, I was, just like, I was at the vet. I was like, what the fuck is going on? This guy, meth guy is like going bananas over here. Can I ask you a question you don't have to answer? Sure. Were you armed? That was like, it was literally, I just went to the vet, so I wasn't armed. I'm like, I'm armed right now. I mean, like, ta-da, boom. Uh, <laughs> Montana way of life. Probably for the best uh, I just, for him that you weren't armed. <laughs> well, yeah, and I was like... uh I just was like, well, literally just like, oh, I'm just going to the vet with the dogs. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't think about it. I just didn't. And I was, and I literally, I looked at Terry. I was like, man, the one time I wasn't like packing some guy, like some crazy person came in. Do you, do you think you could have handled him? I could have, but it was one of those things where it was like, A, it didn't need to escalate to like a weapons scenario. And B, it really didn't even need to escalate to a, like a fisticuffs scenario. It was one of those where it's like, I have a clear opportunity to say like, this guy's crazy. I can just walk away. Yeah. Why fight? You don't need to fight. Like, why are you like, we're both at the vet for a reason. His, he's having issues with his animals. I'm having issues with my animals. He's what I assume to be inebriated. Let it go. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It's just one of those, like I had that moment though, where I was like, am I going to kill this guy right now on the street? And then I was like, no, that's, that's silly. It was like silly of me. Like you're being silly. Get out of it. This guy's crazy. Yeah. You're going to laugh. You're going to laugh at this tomorrow. Yeah. I had a guy talk shit to me, of course, in Philly. And I'm sure you've probably heard this story before. <laughs> And I was like on the phone with someone else while I was talking shit and they got in my face and I was just like, I saw the scenario real quick. I'm going to single leg him into this wall. I'm going to bludgeon him to death. And then like, there's just a huge public space and I'm completely exposed and like everyone's going to see, and there's 50 security cameras of me murdering guy. And I'm like, you know, he probably just gets into fights all the time. And what am I doing? I wanted to be like, you know, the jujitsu place I train at is down the street. Come sign a waiver and whatever issue you have, I'm sure we can work it out. But I was just like, Ugh. and it sucks because we're all, you know, males and we want to like be territorial. But at some point, you just got to be reasonable and be like, I have everything to lose here and almost nothing to gain. 
Right. And that's that. the other thing too. It's like, you know, that's going to be on some security camera where somebody's going to look at that and see you like on top of some yeah. skinny guy or meth guy, right. And yeah. beating the shit out of them. And it's like, who's going to look bad in that situation. Yeah. People think the victim in a fight is the most to lose. I don't know if you lose a fight. Yeah. You could get killed or roughed up real bad. If you win a fight, you go to jail for a long time. Cause now you're the perpetrator. So it's, yeah. it's, and th you think fights a lot are of bad. like you can pop somebody and if you knock them out and their head hits the concrete and they so, die, yeah. like, or, it's a bad yeah, situation. Homicide, at least. Yeah, not good. So that was my life. It's been a fun week. It's been a fun week. Sounds great. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get into it. Yeah, let's do it. Super. Oh, super, I got a screen share here. Super. Dirt. All right. Whenever you're ready. I am ready. Who are we starting off with here today? Let us go and start at the top as usual and start with Airy Small. All right, got it. He's not very big, but he is small, isn't he? Any Airy? <laughs> I was thinking Harry Small Wiener, which is kind of like yeah. the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, ready? Ready. Harry Small asks, "Hi, Docs. Certain exercises, such as Rudolph flies." Only give me a pump slash sense of disruption would take it very close to failure, zero to one RIR. Would it be better to train closer to failure from the start of the meso for these movements and adjust mainly in volume, reps, and weight? By starting further from failure on these movements feels like you're producing very little stimulus. Yes, it's fine. What I would do is should test the idea, try to do one and a half times the volume and not get super close to failure and see if you still have the same pump and disruption. And if you literally done like one and a half times the volume, but it's literally not even close to the same pump and disruption. Yeah, you can go close to failure to start with. Like, if that's the only thing that gets you what you're getting, then yeah, 100%. James? Um, yeah, I agree with Mike. And I would also just say, like, keep in mind, like rear delt flies, you might just not get a lot of pump and or disruption from any of those movements. It's just one of those muscle groups. You're not going to feel it as much as something like even like your biceps or even a similar muscle group like your, your lats or your rhomboids. It's just one of those, like, if you're putting in the work, you're doing a reasonable RIR, I think you're, you're fine. Is This is one of those, like, don't, um, one of those paralysis by analysis situations. Don't overthink. It's like some, some muscles, you're just not going to have that same response. And that's okay. Yep. And then number two, when you talk about intensity techniques, I haven't seen you mention cluster sets. I guess it would be related to my reps. However, I view cluster sets as being mini sets generally under five reps after the initial set. Would this still be beneficial even though they aren't hitting the minimum of five reps? This can be seen uh, part of a larger set that is hitting in excess of five whilst at the same time hitting quote unquote effective reps close to failure multiple times one set. Um, I don't mention uh, intensity techniques or James and I don't mention it in our discussions of hypertrophy because cluster sets are not a hypertrophy technique. They're a strength power technique um, mostly a strength technique. Um, and, uh, basically, yeah, the hypertrophy version would be myo reps. How long to rest between myo reps is not exactly clear. So cluster sets and myo reps can be seen on the same spectrum, uh, of, you know, intentionally shortened rest breaks to accomplish something. Um, and cluster sets are mostly just a way to save time. Uh, otherwise they don't have a ton of value. Uh, and, would it be beneficial? Yeah, sure. Would it be as beneficial as hitting at least five reps per set? No, probably not, not uh, that close. So I would stay away from cluster sets from a hypertrophy, pure hypertrophy perspective. James? Yeah, totally agreed on that. And another thing is like Mike and I don't talk a lot about intensity techniques really at all. Uh, it's because we, we want people to mostly focus on getting the uh, solid framework for your basic training because just your standard set and rep stuff is what really carries you throughout the entirety of your athletic career, whether you're in sports or hypertrophy training or just health and fitness. I think when you start, like if Mike and I were just went on a tangent and we were just like, you know what? Drop sets are the fucking cool, blah, blah, blah. If we just start talking about drop sets and everyone's going to be asking us about drop sets and fucking up their programs, trying to focus on drop sets too much. When that's not what we want. Really what we want people to do is just have the bare bones stuff done immaculately. And you can explore the intensity techniques, um, you know, at your leisure or when you start, not seeing the results that you want anymore, but it's one of those, like, uh, you don't hear us talking about it because we don't think it's probably that important most of the time. All right. Number two, George Sterner, right below Harry Small. Got it. 
Very small. Uh, got a lot of got a lot of activity on this thread. He says, "Hey, Docs, does having a high work capacity, like an elite CrossFit athlete, impact the volume landmarks when training for hypertrophy?" It absolutely does. Just like any, just like having a low or normal or anything else. I mean, of course, yeah. It's, I'm wondering if he's saying like. Uh, I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. It's almost I'm, I'm a moment. I'm, are we looking for a little ego stroking, a little pat on the back here for being a CrossFit person? What are we talking about? Uh, you know, it's like, of course, it would impact it. Your work capacity and your recoverability are directly tied into the volume landmarks for all purposes. Um, but for somebody who might be more of a type one, more enduring person or someone with a high work capacity, yeah, those things generally get shifted up a little bit. Just that's the norm. So just to clarify what James meant, the... Let's take this in context because there's two different questions here. One is somebody has a high work capacity and just shows up or two, somebody has a high work capacity and is still doing CrossFit. Okay. We're just going to assume still doing CrossFit, but there's a slightly different answer to the question of they transition from CrossFit to bodybuilding and then they don't do CrossFit anymore, but they have that history. I'll just answer that in the context of someone training for CrossFit, uh, also training for hypertrophy, their maintenance volume is going to be fairly small because they're already doing a lot of volume that is relatively stimulative in their uh, CrossFit training. Their minimum effective volume is again going to be relatively small because they're already doing a lot of hypertrophic training in their CrossFit stuff. Their maximum, uh, the MRV is going to be probably pretty normal uh, on the lower end uh, because their CrossFit training is so interfering that they won't be able to recover from that and, and their hypertrophic training. MEV, I'll answer it this way. We're not going to talk about where the MEV is because between the MEV uh, and MRV, uh, let's talk about the curve height, how tall the MEV is, like how much growth do they get out of every workout. The answer is both because of their slower twitch fiber type from being CrossFitters and because of the interference effect on multiple levels from CrossFit training, their curve magnitude is just not going to be very high. So what it ends up being is like they can train probably as much as a normal bodybuilder. And you think, how the fuck could they train like a normal bodybuilder uh, and still recover? Well, because they're fucking badass at recovering their CrossFitters, right? But because they're training CrossFit plus bodybuilding, they get a very, very small effect. It does enhance their hypertrophy, but not nearly as what you would expect is if they would quit. Now, if they quit CrossFit, still had all the endurance, then got to bodybuilding, their uh, maintenance volume would, would be you know uh, fairly small, their minimum effective volume would be quite large because their minimum effective, uh, the, the amount of volume it would take to get them into, uh, you know, they're, they're just really slower twitch and they're, they've been training for a long time. They're quite resistant to hypertrophy. So the minimum effective volume would be quite large. And then the maximum recovery volume, like James said, shifted up would also be incredibly high. But again, their maximum adaptive volume would still be pretty muted because of the, the way they got to their endurance, a lot of it's systemic factors, which are good, but some of it is local muscular factors like higher activity of AMPK, slower fiber conversion. So they just won't get as much out of their hypertrophy training. So something you would expect from CrossFitters that transition from CrossFit to bodybuilding is over the years, this is kind of cool if they just focus on bodybuilding, their MEVs probably either stay or reduce a little bit as they get stronger and they lose their crazy fiber types they had from CrossFit. And their MRVs probably decline. They'd be like, I used to be able to do 40 sets a week back when I was a CrossFitter, but now I can only do 20. Like, well, good, your legs are bigger, motherfucker. And that's because their MAV is going to start rising throughout that entire time as they put the CrossFit behind them. So... Yeah, and um, just I think I think somebody might interpret what you said maybe in a weird way. Um, but like just to, another clarification, uh, you can't possibly train CrossFit and train as a full time like bodybuilding training at the same time. You could, but one of those certainly would tank, right? So example, if you're doing full hypertrophy training like a bodybuilder would, you're all of your volume landmarks for all of your CrossFit stuff would just immediately go in the tank. You would not be able to be fast, explosive, skillful at many things. You would just be unable to do those things. And if you train full-time, you know, CrossFit and then try to switch over to bodybuilding full-time, there's just a competition for too many resources. So what we generally do, uh, this happens all the time with the RP and I have tons of clients like this when they, um, come from a CrossFit background and they say, Hey, I want to, you know, like either lose weight or gain weight. What we usually say is like, Hey, why don't you just dial down your CrossFit training to more maintenance volumes? This doesn't mean you have to stop, but we want you to do as much hypertrophy training as you can to preserve and or gain muscle while you're in this period, but just do enough CrossFit training to maintain your feel, maintain your technique, maintain your familiarity with all those workouts and your endurance. 
And that's a very, very welcome compromise. And then once they get to like their maintenance phase, we can dial down their weightlifting and dial back up their CrossFit training and it works great. It's a really easy fix. Yeah. Um, great point, James. Uh, sorry. What I meant by that was the first example was somebody who splits training 50, 50 CrossFit bodybuilding and they used to be in a CrossFitter. Uh, then they can actually, yeah, which is kind of done anyway, of bodybuilding right? training. Right. But people do that shit all the time, man. Like, yeah. uh, all right. Uh, number next number. Number three is going to be Charles Austin. Just a little bit down. Got it. So he says, there are some exercises where I can only do a certain number of reps with a fairly large weight range. The most obvious offenders for me are calves for calf raises and traps for shrugs. There is a standing calf machine at my gym that I can select anywhere from 90 to 150 pounds on the stack, and I fail it around 10 reps every time. <laughs> I know exactly, <laughs> I know exactly, exactly what you're exactly talking what about. Mean too. I do my best to standardize ramen tempo, what gives. So there's a couple of things that could be going on from my perspective. One of the most obvious ones is you have a huge fraction of faster twitch muscle fibers that propel your calves to do what they do. And they all kind of give out at the same time uh, when they train them light. They, essentially, they're only active in contraction for so long because they fatigue so fast. So if they're contracting, 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 and they give out, that happens if they give out with a heavy weight or lightweight. They just sort of time themselves out. And that's probably a real big reason for that. I tend to notice that in my muscle groups that are the best responsive, fastest twitch, uh, that they tend to just have a certain rep range they can hit with a huge variety and like i'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce the weight and do more reps and i get to rep 12 and it's like uh, i can't do it i'm like what the hell happened and it's just it's a really awesome because it's a great you know the muscle failed and everything and you got a good stimulus uh but it just you're just not doing a whole lot more reps because there's an inherent limit there on the uh the fatigability of, of the muscle um and another consideration and this is probably not in small muscles but in large ones sometimes there are systemic factors that are cap you anyway for a certain duration like squatting like you you're not going to be able to squat past a certain number of reps or in a big rate range you can squat for 15s because you just run out of breath after 15 reps anyway not what's happening to you but another category that can that can allow that to happen yeah, squats are a great example of that or for a lot of people like once you get to 10 like after 10, like it doesn't matter if you drop 50 pounds, like you're just not getting much more than 10 at some point, right? And uh, it's a really good one. I've had that with uh, like pull-ups for me is one of those uh, ones where it's like I can have 25 pounds or unweighted. I'll get to 10 and either way and that's about it. <laughs> it's not going to, if I take if I take 25 pounds off, it doesn't seem to be any better. Uh, I I do think like what Mike Mike's explanation there about like the faster twitch contribution is probably the the most likely answer, and then some other exercises that could be systemic factors as well. But we're all just built a little bit differently. That's okay. You might also just like have anthropometry for that uh, uh, particular movement that's just unfavorable. So you're always going to just gas out a little bit more on some movements than that, rather than others. Yep. Next up, Mantas Biliputis. Got it. Uh, oh, right. he's trying to sneak in a couple here. Yeah, let's take maybe the first two. How about that? Sounds good. Number one, should beginners start a body weight jump training program with only one or two exercises for a few sets three to four times a week? Some no. people are obsessed with hitting at least 100 foot contact uh, a session, which would take at least 20 sets with regular power training reps. James. Yeah, beginners shouldn't shouldn't be doing jump programs. That's really the issue. The beginners should be focusing on uh, a muscle mass or strength gaining program and familiarizing themselves with jumping techniques, but it should not be a jump centric program, if that makes sense. So it doesn't mean that you don't jump. It just means that the jumps that you do are generally pretty low impact and are mainly focused on learning the techniques and landing techniques of those jumps. If, uh, if somebody came to me and they're like, here's my beginner jumping program, like I would immediately just, just do like one of these cause it's like, because it's pretty clearly demonstrated that beginners don't need to do specific plyometric training and they actually benefit just as much in the short term from strength training and probably in the long term much more from a face potentiated model of like building muscle, building strength, and then eventually transitioning in the longer years into more specific plyometric training. So I would not do it that way. If you have a beginner, you can they will see massive improvements in their jumps from doing sets of 10 in the squats. You know what I mean? Something like that. Or even sets of five. I mean, something. So I would say focus on the strength and muscle mass aspects first, teach them t techniques. And then as they kind of hit more and more and more milestones across their training age, then you start incorporating more and more intense versions of the jump training. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that, James. There's just like an element of transition there where you don't ever start jump training in the sense of like, let's do it. You ease into it. And so any recommendation, like the people that start with 100 foot contacts a week, it's just some fucking damn near. Insane. It's insane. It's just like a fucking stupid thing. People, there's a dumbass program back in the 90s when the internet was like you had to log on or whatever, um, air <laughs> alert or whatever, and people would download it and print it up and like they would do it. And it was like a bunch of calf races and stuff like, yo, bro, I'm going to get my fucking jumps up, bro. Like fucking basketball. Like shut the, it, it's the like mindless, mindless fucking shit. doesn't fucking work. And then people nowadays are like, man, jump training. I want to fuck get my hops up. Like it doesn't. That's not how optimum works for sure. Now you could probably just from training more, you'd be able to jump higher, but you're probably just better off spending your time playing more basketball. If you want to do things the right way, like a real athlete would, you ease into them based on needs and needs analysis and phasic structure and building building blocks to get to where you, you need to go, not by like jumping into a program, especially with something like jumping, which can be overtrained so quickly. Look at fucking Jace jumps. I'm telling you guys, if you're interested in jumps, this guy was just asking us maybe like a year ago ish. I don't remember the exact timeline about like, I want to jump. And we, we basically echoed these same points. Like here's how you, you do, you know, work capacity, hypertrophy, you work into some strength, you work into some maximal strength, maybe cycle back if you have a big timeline. And then eventually you work your way into like a peaking protocol for jumping. And this motherfucker is, I can't, I can't get over his videos. They're so good. It gets me pumped. Yeah. You got a guy who's, I think he's like 5'7", and he's going to dunk. It's amazing. That's Fucking crazy. Muggsy Bogues over here. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, next question from Mantas Pelipuches. Mantas will give you two today. Uh, can greasing the groove, focusing on frequency of sessions but neglecting overload, be better for novices who have under six months of experience in conventional training? So the, the one way it can is it allows them more practice technique. Doing more frequent sessions elevates your technique faster, and technique is such a huge part of beginner gains anyway that it absolutely can do that. Um, now, it, neglecting overload, <laughs> I'll put you this way. I'll answer this yeah. the best way I can until before James bites the rest of your head off. Mine says, I'm just kidding, but that's <laughs> um, If you have to have a program that neglects a fundamental principle of training, you're in deep shit as to why you're asking to do that. It's like asking for no salt recipes for fettuccine Alfredo. And someone goes, Oh, are you salt sensitive blood pressure? You're like, no, like, so you don't like salt to like, no, I love it. It's great. I'm just wondering if you can make it taste good with no salt. Like, What? Why the fuck would your salt is like the number one ingredient to make food tasty? What are you talking about? Right? So uh, I'm not, I'm, I mean, it's a completely legitimate question on your part, but just ranting here is you don't want to fucking overload is a thing you want and and to sort of like um uh dovetail off something eric helms is big on which is huge is you got to establish the quality of your training first before looking at frequency or volume or any of that stuff so every set you do first of all every rep you do should be really good and then every set you do should be very stimulative and then you can ask how many sets am i do and then you can ask how often should i repeat that workout so don't look like neglect overload it's a fucking bad idea and it's not going to get you optimum results can it get you pretty good results just by ramping up the frequency yes and here's where i get to my main point final point if you told someone hey dude you can fucking get in tons of sessions and get almost as good as you would just getting fewer sessions but training harder that's going to be like great and they're going to be like wait wait, wait, wait. so you want me to dilute the value of my sessions so that i can do more of them to get the same or worse result you're like yeah man grease the groove and they're like what and, and this answer just answers, answers greasing the groove question altogether people are like what do you think about greasing the groove like for biceps you're doing 10 pull-ups a day and blah, blah blah do three fucking actual back workouts a week motherfucker i'll tell you i be pros don't get that big doing 10 pull-ups a day or some shit like that it's a fine way to train it's fine and it's very effective but it's time use economy is fucking shit and it's fatigue management is fucking shit there's no periodization what do you stop progressing do you stop progressing my back doesn't grow anymore i do 10 pull-ups every day what do i do well what the fuck were you doing such a dog shit do 11. Ass fucking program I can't. Yeah, 11. can't oh sorry so do good workouts, wait till you recover, and then repeat them. Sometimes that's higher frequency, sometimes it's lower. The overload can reduce and increase, but you want to keep within margins. If you have to take, basically saying neglecting overload, make the workouts so easy, they're not even overloading, just to grease the groove a lot, you get a lot of real technical proficiency, but your size and strength gains will be suboptimal. Yeah, so I totally agree with Mike, and my initial reaction was exactly Mike's reaction, but the, when I, 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 I think I, I understand kind of what he's getting at here, and 
hopefully we can maybe split the difference. So um, for novices, what we would include, and this is very common, and this is what you do in sport training, people just don't think of it the same way, um, is technique sessions. And that's something that you could do, right? Now, it's maybe not the, the greatest use of your time to have them doing a lot of technique sessions throughout the week on basic lifts like squats and stuff. You can do that, and that's okay. Um, but it's better spent doing other things like kind of like their sporting stuff. So for example, if you show up to a soccer practice, a baseball practice or a rugby practice, right? You're gonna get a lot of repetitions on some really basic things the first couple of weeks that you're there. And then it starts getting a little bit harder as you go. Same thing here, you can, you can do like technique sessions, but for pretty basic things like your bench pressing, your squatting, your deadlifting, it's probably unnecessary. And I think what Mike was saying, like just focus on the actual quality of the real training sessions. That should be the biggest priority. And if you think that getting a little bit more contact time, a few more repetitions or exposures can benefit their technique in some way, which and the literature actually does support this, especially for sporting skills. And that's something that I've been researching for the last couple of years for skills and, and tactics, particularly increasing your exposures seems to be a, a much better idea than increasing the duration of each exposure. So it's kind of the opposite of hypertrophy training in many ways, where it's like, you, sometimes you just want short little bursts of high quality exposures and the more frequency, sometimes the better, not always. Um, so that's a good, from a technique perspective, but it's just a lot of, like Mike said before, it's just not a good use of your time. So I would say focus on getting that good quality training session. And for more complicated things, like if you had a weightlifter, I would say, yes, absolutely. Technique sessions throughout the week is a very good idea. If you have somebody who's just trying to do bodybuilding, no, just learn how to do the movements in training and keep making progress as you go and don't waste a lot of energy, uh, needlessly rehearsing technique. Yep, 100%. All right, the next person. I'm gonna hit one that didn't have a ton of likes, but it's up here in the algorithm. And uh, it's a very interesting question that we haven't answered in a while. Just wanna make sure that we're clear on this. So it's going to be Nicholas Markey, just below Charles Austin. Got it. So he says, number one, is there much, any evidence that artificial sweetener slash diet cokes cause harm often uh, the natural crowd calls these poison. Um, the balance of the evidence is that if you believed they caused harm, you would have to believe all sorts of completely nonsensical things for which there's actually more evidence. So no, the balance of the evidence pretty much shows that within huge boundaries of intake, uh, you know, just fucking gallons of fucking Diet Coke a day, there's no detectable harm whatsoever and there's not even a theorized harm. So the almost exclusively, the anti-artificial sweetener attitude is a perfect example of people just not being scientific and just fear mongering. Plain and simple. Um, James, yeah. do you have anything to add to number one? Yeah, um, just keep in mind, right? Like water is poison in enough in high enough dosages, right? And that's really the issue here. It's is are artificial sweeteners uh, causing harm within? you know, what we would call reasonable or operable dosages. And that's kind of the issue. So if you are drinking or consuming these things in, in quantities that are like beyond the scope of normal daily use, and we can debate what that is, but I think most of us would largely agree or at least overlap on what we think that is most more often than not, then no, the answer is no. They're, they're within normal use. They seem to be completely fine. And that's kind of the issue. So you can take any substance, any chemical, any food, anything, and it's poisonous at a certain dosage, right? And so if you cling on to that and say, well, if you just keep adding more and more dose, it becomes poisonous. Therefore, it's poison. That's a very weak argument from a scientific perspective. Number two, is there evidence that lean deli meats, the high protein user fat kinds, cause harm to a degree that should be concerned about when consumed to daily moderate amounts like less than a pound? Uh, the jury's still out on that, I would say. So there are some good studies that show that uh, uh, various additives to deli meats are not incredibly healthy in the long term. Um, but then when you factor, you start factoring out other junk food intake and other processed food intake. Uh, out of the equation and the lifestyle elements that seem to come with daily meat, like smoking and an activity, you start reducing the level of harm to sometimes un in some studies undetectable levels. Uh, so what I would say is because we don't know, uh, but some studies uh, 
quite a group of studies have showed that there's a potential harm there. That's tiny, the harm is tiny, right? But it is like a lifetime accumulated risk, certain kinds of cancers, especially. Um, what I would say is if you can eat the deli meat more in moderation, maybe a sandwich here every other day, instead of like pound of deli meat every day, I would probably do that for the time being until the research, until the research got clear. Um, but if you're eating you know, deli meat here and there and you're super worried about it, I wouldn't be worried about it because in context, the risk, if it exists at all, is going to be incredibly small. And you got to be careful with early research on stuff because there's a file drawer effect, which means especially early in the publication on a certain topic, uh, people only tend to publish the preliminary, the extensions of preliminary studies that, that found the, an actual effect, um, which is why it's interesting. Uh, I believe Greg Knuckles, like a big, big, big proponent of this form of scientific inquiry called, I, I believe, registered reports. It's basically like if you want someone to take your scientific study seriously, you register it before it occurs, which means that you can't file draw it because you have to publish the data you have off it. Otherwise, it just gets removed from, you know, it just, it doesn't get removed. You registered it, but then there was a null finding. It looks really, really bad on you institutionally. And we also know that there's a bunch of studies that were done that reported nothing. So we can't say, see, all studies report that this happened. Because like, 900 studies haven't been published. Who knows what they report? People just didn't finish them for some odd reason. Then people could look into it more. Um, so Because uh, right now, you publish a study only after it's finished, but you could just never publish it if you want. So if you work at a lab, which is basically known as the lab that shows that meat, deli meats are bad, and you find a, you, you do three experiments and they show deli meats are fine, you're like, maybe you'll publish one, maybe you'll publish zero. Right, because uh, you know ideology is still a thing in science. So, at the end of the day, especially research doesn't have uh, a ton behind it yet. You got to watch for things like the file drawer effect and uh, way too many false positives and saying well, this is bad, and then you five more studies are like that's actually not bad at all. Uh, the eggs are a real good example of that. In the 80s and 90s, there was quite a bit of research that eggs are really bad, and it turns out it's mostly just correlates of like the kind of people that eat six eggs a day are also fat pieces of shit that just fucking. Don't give a yes. flying fuck about their health truckers and shit. Yeah. Smell yelling at someone. Uh, everyone's yelling right now. Everyone's yelling. So uh, so basically at the end of the day, they did a bunch more studies, better studies, control trials. And what they found was that eggs are actually in many ways very healthy in the context of calorie balanced diet. So in, uh, you know, physical activity and so on and so forth. So I, I would really take like a huge grain of salt, LOL, with the deli meat. Uh, but, you know, being <laughs> that there's some research, I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't just eat deli meat for every single meal every single day, and then ten studies come out saying it's bad for your health, and you're like, "What the fuck? I have no idea." Like, well, you know, you could have like sort of uh, had a little bit more trepidation. About it, but. Yeah, I totally agree with Mike's points. I have not looked into this personally, but Dr. Wife Mel did look into this a little bit, and she. So I'm going to just paraphrase what she told me. So I don't want to don't want to take any credit for this because she told me, and she did a. Seems like a really good job. It seems like the, the deli meats that are just fresh cuts of whatever type of meat, like if it's just chicken and turkey and stuff like that, the, the effects seem to be almost none. It just seems to be like a healthy, you know, it's a pretty healthy uh, protein option. It's really the ones where they, uh, there's a lot of processing, smoking. And so if you have like a, a fucking Genoa Salam, some Gulats, so any of those like weird mystery meats like you're fucking if you eat a lot of like bologna and shit that I, I believe if i'm if i'm interpreting what she said correctly that's where more of the, the potential issues can be it's those more processed meats the the ones that are just like you know cut turkey cut chicken stuff like that without a lot of like smoking or any kind of additional processing those seem to not really have any major consequences at least from what i understand yeah that, that's that's absolutely insightful Let's scroll down, James, to Eduardo Narciso oh. Salazar. Oh, my God. My Such a God. spicy name. All right. Eduardo says, hi, docs. Thanks for everything. Eduardo, are you breaking up with us? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have some questions on interference effect. Many important organizations, the American Heart Association, the, what the fuck is the ADA again? The uh, Assistant District Attorney and the World Health Organization. <laughs> American <laughs> Dietetics <laughs> Association. Dietetics? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> recommend <laughs> at least one. <laughs> Sorry, you got me on that one. No, no, no worries. ADA Barba. <laughs> uh, recommend at least 150 minutes of aerobic training per week for optimum health. As someone who's interested in strength sports, number one, how does one go about building strength while following this recommendation? 
or should you just accept the fact that you won't be as strong as you could be? Well, first of all, you have to accept that fact. Second of all, you can split up your sessions to go as far away as possible, uh, relatively low from your training, uh, relatively low intensity, have good nutrition, balance your, make sure not to exceed your MRV, but I'll give you actually really, really good news. You don't have to do any outright cardio because all of these recommendations are made completely in the absence yes. of the fact that yes. you're doing high volume resistance training. Yes. High volume resistance training, you train five days a week hard for an hour each time, checks every fucking box of physical activity. So you don't have to worry about a thing. If you do that, you're already golden. All you have to do on top of that is just don't be a total slob. Walk around a little bit, get your step count going, be active, till go on some hikes, and then you're fucking golden. The cardio recommendations are for people who don't do anything. You're serious about your goals, and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was going to go there, and I'm glad you made that point. And really, uh, for people who are relatively physically active, like they do somewhat regular exercise, uh, we're talking about like 20 to 30 minutes per week is is sufficient of like direct cardio training. And by that, I, I, that includes like a brisk walk, by the way, is more than enough to actually stimulate gains in cardiovascular health, right? And so we're talking like a very, very, very low dose response relationship for people who are generally pretty physically active. But, but, but I'm glad Mike said that because if you're yeah. lifting weights and doing that stuff, as long as you're not getting fucking winded going up the stairs or like tying your shoes, like doing really basic shit, you're probably fine. Yep. All right. I have a quick idea and then we'll go on to the next question. Cool. Actually, you can preload the next question. It is Emilian Machiavelli, uh, big mm. blue E down, down quite a bit. Holy spicy names tonight. This motherfucker got hanging out with and uh ten What lights. the yep. Got it. All right. My idea. Ready? Oh, sorry, yeah. We sell some kind of product or service which is just we deliver you like cuffs for your arms or like a sweater with pads for your chest and we call it game simulation and the fine print is that we're only simulating what it would be like if you were jacked very oddly but people misread it half the time and think it's game stimulation and they think it's going to get them jacked so they wear stupid sweaters we make money and they learn a rough lesson in buyer beware. James, what do you think? Uh, there was actually an episode of SpongeBob, which basically did this. I don't know if you watched SpongeBob at all, but when the, he had the anchor arms, uh, which was just like a, like a jacked pair of arms you could put on to look cool. And they had like tattoos on it and shit. Oh my God. That was a really That's funny it. episode. It's good. It's good. I'm, I'm all for it. Emilian Machiavelli asks, hello humans with deep striations on both body and brain. The deep striations in the brain is probably not good. That's not what good. I suffer from. Go get that looked at. I really appreciate that you give valuable insights to random people. Uh, I get a question about metabolic rate. Thank you so much. Well, you're not random. You're here on YouTube. Um, this might uh, really help people lose weight because they would not gain any while reverse dieting, making it easier to accept and adhere to. I do alternate day fasting because for me, it's less annoying and energy demanding than chronic calorie restriction. In a chronic calorie restriction, we know that metabolic rate drops to maintain uh, with how much you're eating. Thus, uh, it will get you to maintain with 2,000 with a body fat that could be maintained before, let's say 2,500. I don't know. Oh, eventually. Yeah, metabolic rate probably doesn't drop that much. But it does I think, I think uh, physical like, activity yeah. and stuff uh, do drop uh, unconsciously. So okay, we'll so so we'll we'll just call it all of neat, all of metabolic adaptation together. Um, number two, uh, okay. So number one, what happens with metabolic rate if you eat your maintenance, let's say twenty five hundred calories on the eating days, zero calories on the fasting days? Will metabolic rate drop 
Will it drop faster or slower? Will chronic calorie restriction or will it not drop uh, at all or very little? Um, we have very good reason to believe that if they say take a month, 15 days of that, you ate nothing, interspersed, uh, you know, equidistantly with days, uh, 15 of them in which you ate uh, more, that your metabolic rate change at the end of that month would be almost identical, if not identical, to one in which you made the same monthly calorie reduction just off every day. Because during the end of the days, when you are calorie restricted completely, your metabolism will start to dip. And then during the end of the day, when you are feeding like a lot, uh, cause you know, it's like, you eat like 4,000 calories or some shit. Towards the end of the day, your, met 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 uh, your metabolism, your, bidi, 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 death all, folks. Uh, your metabolism would rise to higher than normal levels. And then the balance is probably almost the same. Is he talking about just doing like, like all, literally going back and forth, like not eating at all on one day and then oh, yeah. 25. True yeah. alternate day fasting. Yeah. yeah. And then he says, what about if you eat on a surplus of 500, let's say 3000 cal calories on eating days, zero calories on fast days, how would the body react? Is there a possibility to reach your body true caloric maintenance, or rising your metabolic rate this way without gaining weight? So there's really no way to increase your body's metabolic rate without gaining weight unless it's recovering yes. from an old reduction. Once it's recovered from an old reduction, there's no trick to use to get it to go super high. Um, that's definitely the case. Um, and, and then he says, of course, you can add how many grams of protein you consider sensible on fasting days for the protein sparing effect. I mean, if you're talking about uh, sensible, then it's hundreds of grams of protein because Anything less is not going to be very muscle sparing. So the most sensible thing to do is just to not do alternate day fasting. If you want some days more calories, some days less, that's fine. I will tell you, say this, if you try to gain weight, you eat a surplus, this is the last thing I'll say about this, if you eat a surplus and you only eat every other day, you will gain a fraction of the total muscle you could have uh, and more fat actually, because your body will be eating a ton of food in one day, which you can't possibly turn into muscle. Uh, and then be starving another day in which the muscle growth is just not going to happen and some loss will occur. So uh, I would say consistency of caloric uh, surplus is much, much better than uh, these super crazy ups and downs. Um, uh, you know, if it's worth it lifestyle to you for cutting and you're not super worried about muscle retention, alternate fasting works really well. And it's really healthy. Um, if you're concerned remotely about optimizing muscle retention and muscle growth, alternate day fasting is probably not the wisest thing in the world to do. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think people who are really big, so I, I'm not against fasting for personal preference reasons and uh, just, you know, things along those lines. Um, but I think the fasting crowd has like desperately clings to the idea that fasting has all these various life hacks, which they just don't. And I don't want to like poo poo the idea because again, if it works better for you and it's something that you can comply with and it fits your needs and stuff like, yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Um, but there's nothing magic going on there. Mike already explained why. And I just, I have to just reiterate that point. There's no like crazy life hacks going on with the fasting. There are potentially some health implications there. Maybe, maybe not. But in terms of like, if you want to be like a, if you want to have like a real killer body comp or you want to be a really good athlete, I really just don't, I would advise against it. All right. Nolts. Oh, it is Nolts. About that. All right. All right. Let's see. What are your opinions on taking a week completely off? Some like cardio instead of taking a deal a week. Muscle and strength loss won't occur since it's just a week, so why not let the CNS recover 100%? and recover fully mentally as well. And it is their way to recover between mouse cycles with being the least amount of time in the gym. As a student, I don't have lots of free time. Therefore, uh, I, I really don't. Okay. This is, I have to say this, this is really a personal a, note. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say you're, you're, you don't get that. You don't get to pull that card here. <laughs> the, James and I have been professors. I'm a, I'm a professor again. Uh, we've been students for, I guarantee you a very, very long time. Cumulatively. We know how it works. We've been to college for too fucking long. You have fuck. You have fuck load of free time. You're just you're using it to do fuck all. So. If you have time to train, then you have time to deload, homie. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, but in any case, uh, I don't have a lot of free time. Therefore, taking a week off or doing just a few like that, uh, two deload uh, sessions in a recovery week. 
be a great recovery mentally, physically, and having more free time. Uh, no, and you're totally right about that. It def- definitely has some advantages. Absolutely true. It's not that I don't like going to the gym, but going to the gym feeling fatigued isn't really pleasant. True, totally. Going for a walk outside or doing some like cardio would be a lot more enjoyable. So uh, is there a way to do it? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to really condense your deload, get most of it out of it, do two sessions in your deload week. One relatively heavy session with much lower volume early in the week. Later in the week, one light session with very little volume, just going through the motions, kind of a big warm up, And that, that means you come to the gym twice. As a matter of fact, that second session you can probably do with bodyweight stuff wherever you are, especially if you have a tree branch to do some pull-ups off of. That's it. Okay, that's as easy as it gets, and it gives you 90-some percent of the benefits of, um, of the, uh, the, the deload. The reason – so there's a couple just real quick. Uh, week off is fine. It gives you probably 70 or 80 percent of what you were after versus deloading. Deloading is better because doing light training actually lets you recover faster uh, and more completely than taking a week off completely. Uh, believe it or not, CNS and all that recovers faster if you're training light and, and deload style and, and probably more thoroughly. Uh, and also it allows you to maintain fitness a little bit better, specifically maintain technique, uh, which means if you're a strength power athlete, then you're definitely going to be stronger after the deload by a long shot as opposed to trying to find your, your, uh, your Bambi feet again. James. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the kind of, there's kind of like a, maybe a three tier punch there is though, like Mike already said, one, it seems to doing the deload seems to be better than not doing the deload in terms of uh, retaining your performance Two, you're, if you just take a week off, um, you're essentially deconditioning across the board, not only in terms of your muscle mass, but in terms of your technique and a variety of other things. Um, and I had a third one, which I can't seem to remember. But those are probably the two biggest ones, right? So you don't really gain much by taking the week off outside of just time and, and mental break from doing the training stuff. So we usually say, like, just do it. Uh, and if, if you can get the same basic effect from doing two days per week, which is very doable, just do it. Why? Because your muscles won't be uh, atrophying as much and your technique won't be degrading as much. And you're going to get all the benefits of taking the deload, right, versus just taking the time off, which is okay, but not as good. So, that oh, that was it. That was the third one. So you have your deconditioning in terms of your – you know, your muscle and in terms of your technique, which is also very important. So people ask us this one all the time. We say, when possible, just do the deload. If, if not, try and squish it down into a few days and do the best you can. Yep. All right. Part two of this question is, if you stop training, your muscles will shrink. Atrophy won't occur in the first weeks, but your muscle glycogen stores shrink and the muscle appears smaller or flatter. How long does it take before muscle glycogen stores start to shrink? How long can you go without training before the muscle loses its fullness? So a couple, a couple answers here. One, there is an experimental thing. This is different for different people, so you have to just try. Uh, two is mostly it's not your glycogen reducing. It's the uh, water content and inflammation. I'm working. Can I walk through? Oh, uh, sure. Ah, uh, look at that idiot behind James. Oh, sorry. These people are going to be on the internet forever. Are those Mel's relatives? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, they are. Do they know this is being recorded? Yep. Level of giving a fuck? Zero. Hey, mom and dad. (laughs) Word up. Um, So it's really just the intracellular water and the intracellular damage and inflammation uh, and peripheral damage and inflammation around the muscle cells that's giving you that fullness from training. It's not the glycogen. After that intracellular damage goes away and you eat some carbs, you can actually load more glycogen. The, the total amount of time is five to seven days, I would say, of when your muscles can look their fullest after training. Right after from the damage and then later from glycogen is sort of a 50, 50 split as one migrates out, one migrates in. After five to seven days, then you start to lose fullness, uh, mostly because you can't load any more glycogen, and that damage component is very, very small now. And then there's like a tonus, like a nervous system preparation that gives your muscles a bit of a fuller look that starts to decay after that. So yeah, about five to seven days. I wouldn't bank on anything else. So I'll put it this way. If you want to look super jacked, and you, you're going on a camping trip, and a super hot girl gets there at day four, I would train right before the trip. I wouldn't like wait a week and then get four days after that pecs are flat and you're like hey stacy i was, I was always kind of she's like i'm gonna cut you off right here i'm not into guys with small packs to get the fuck away from me and then you're like what, what do you mean she's like get the fuck get the fuck away from me you fucking hurt me fuck you get out get out get out and you're like oh my god oh my god, oh my god. you start crying you run and you just keep running 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's very good. Uh, just keep in mind too, um, all of this is also very much dependent on your physical activity levels. So five to seven days is a pretty good recommendation, but if you don't do dick, like if you just don't exercise or move around all that much, you won't really tap into your glycogen stores all that much. They'll just kind of linger on for a while. Uh, likewise, if uh, you don't lift and you don't do very much physical activity, you are more prone to atrophying than someone who is at least physically active and not lifting, right? And so these are all very much mitigated by your activity levels as well. You can, uh, I mean, the thing that we haven't quite figured out yet, especially with the muscle itself is like, what really is, what really does constitute a maintenance volume in a lot of cases? Because as you get older, it seems like it's very easy for you to preserve the muscle mass that you have accrued over time. And it seems like some very minimal physical activity can help you maintain that muscle in lieu of direct training. Now, if you want to be like Dr. Mike's size, like a bodybuilder, um, yeah, that means that you're going to have to actually do a little bit more direct training than somebody like me, who's just going to have like a dad bod in a few years. Um, but it also seems like, yeah, if you do some physical labor around the backyard. Is that enough to hit an MV in many cases? Yeah, probably for at least some muscle groups, if not many. Um, so we're not really sure. But again, a lot of this is mitigated by how much activity that you do. So if you don't do much activity, you're probably going to see more atrophy and your glycogen stores will probably uh, linger on. So it's kind of the opposite problem. All right, let's scroll all the way up now, James, to Brown T. Thomas Lee. Brown, well, brown tea, Thomas Lee. Just There's above one. the red skull. Oh, <laughs> I thought that, I thought brown tea is in his YouTube. So I thought that was his, like, I thought we had a uh, East versus West Bowl going on here. That'd be sweet. All right. Thomas Lee asks, when do soccer players do hypertrophy phase? Hypertrophy phase will require some fat gain, which I would expect to be suboptimal for performance with season. But their off season, about 12 weeks in top leagues, can be quite short for hypertrophy phase because they're not training hard for much uh, of that time in order to drop fatigue. James hit this one completely. Yeah, so the, this one's kind of tough because some sports like soccer can have multiple seasons. They can do indoor and outdoor. And so what you have to know is going into that is you won't have a lot of time that is appropriately divvied up for hypertrophy, right? So what we usually would say is uh, – for most team sport athletes, you're going to want to do your hypertrophy type training, whether it's to gain muscle or to lose fat in your general preparatory period. So this would be um, kind of like what like he was calling the off season. We would say this is like, you know, probably two to three months or more away from any significant competitions. That's what you want to do that. And then once you start getting into your specific preparation or close to your competition times, you're going to switch to stabilizing your body weight and you're going to just play at that body weight from that, at that point on. The problem is, is that uh, most team sport athletes shouldn't be filling up a huge amount of their time doing body composition alteration. Really, it should be probably like a 10-week thing in little chunks at a time because that's too much time away from doing the things that make you really, really good at soccer. And soccer is a really unique case where you might do indoor and outdoor. So you would, like, for example, if you just did outdoor, you could run a mass phase play the season, and then you could spend your very long off season doing the cut phase to get your body weight back down to a better place. When you've got multiple seasons, you really, you don't have a lot of opportunity to do that. So you might only be able to run like two, four weeks. So maybe like eight weeks of mass, eight weeks of cut at a, in, in a, in an annual cycle. And you just have to make the most of it and make very, very slow, small changes over time. The, the, the thing that you should not do 100, and this is what most people do do, <laughs> do do, um, is they say, I'm a team sport athlete. I'm going to do what bodybuilders do for hypertrophy and just gain a fuckload of weight and just blow up and job up. No, 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 no. Cause now you're way out of your ideal power to weight ratio, your ideal competition, body weight, all of those things. So when you're a team sport athlete, like a soccer player, although you're not a weight, a weight class athlete, you have to keep yourself in a pretty reasonable shot of your ideal competition body weight because you can't spend 15, 20 weeks at a time doing this hypertrophy stuff because that means you're just not be able to train your soccer stuff to its fullest capacity. Why is that? Well, it's because you're going to be doing the highest volume of training that you can essentially tolerate. So that means take your volume landmarks for skills and tactics and, of course, systemic fatigue, right, and dial it all down. There's no way that you can be your sharpest working on your, your skills, drills, tactics 
when you are doing hypertrophy training. So we usually say do them in smaller, like more fast, furious chunks. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little remiss to say this at times, but sometimes you can go above and beyond the typical hypertrophy recommendations that we give in terms of weight, weight rates, uh, sorry, rates of weight loss or gain simply because you just don't have a lot of time to work with. So you might only have eight weeks, 10 weeks, and that's your hypertrophy phase for this, maybe for this annual plan uh, and you're just going to make the most of it. So sometimes we go a little bit harder than we normally do. Luckily, we also don't spend as much time doing those things. So we tend to normalize a little bit more fast. Was that an uh, okay ramble there? I felt like I started to ramble a bit. Totally okay. That's why people pay us the big bucks is to ramble. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and sorry, real shameless plug, shameless plug on that one. Uh, check out the book that I co-authored with the Tudor Bompa Institute. It's called Integrated Periodization. And we lay that, uh, those ideas out more explicitly for like team sports and stuff like that. Yep. All right. Here we go. Just below Yari. Yari. Yari the Red Skull. <laughs> Actually, great question. He says, do different muscle groups have different lengths of protein synthesis muscle growth? Is it assumed that, for example, chest and biceps would have an equally hard exercise? Do they both grow 48 hours, for example? So we actually just don't know. There's not enough direct literature to say that with remotely any conclusiveness. However, it certainly wouldn't be something you would expect to be the same. So prepare for differences if and when science catches up, when science catches up to tell you that. Um, the important caveats for when to read studies that do come out on that is relative volume versus how much actual disruption and stimulus was delivered to the muscle. So if you compare like three sets of squats to three sets of bicep curls, and you realize that the squats grew muscle for longer in the quads than the bicep curls did in the biceps, you may be tempted to think the quads you know, take longer to grow muscle than the biceps. That might not be true. It might just be that the three sets of curls were just not nearly as relatively stimulating the biceps as the three sets of squats were to the quads. So the question would have to be answered, probably a similar level of soreness, similar level of muscle disruption. What I would probably like to see is similar levels of uh, muscle performance decrease. So we stopped the sets on both the quads and biceps once both got to below 70% of their you know, usual reps from set one, something like that. Then you have a much more a relative but objective metric for, for cutting off volume. But that being said, we don't have to know that so much. Here's why. Uh, this is kind of a cool practical insight. We already know that different muscles train different ways, take longer and shorter to recover. We know there's a recovery difference. We also know another thing. With hard training, the duration of recovery is almost certainly at least a little bit longer than the duration of growth. So recovery is almost always the limiting factor in stimulative frequency, not muscle growth. We don't tr not train six times a week because you know we're completely done growing uh, you know, after only two days and anything you know, more frequent would be stupid. You may be done growing after a day, not in every case, but in some cases, but you might not be healed to hit the muscle again in an overloading manner until two days. Fatigue just takes longer to come off than the, than the amount of muscle that you grow during that time. So in any case, you want to train as often as your recovery can allow, uh, whatever level you examine that on, joint connective tissue, muscular, et cetera, it's a complex picture. But in general, if you're waiting so long that everything's really just peeled and you couldn't overload again, but you're not, you're almost certainly killing time and you could train more often and, and be better. Now, if you say, okay, theoretically, I saw that biceps recover every 24 hours, so should I train my muscles once uh, every day? And the answer to that is, well, can you recover from that? And you're like, well, no, hell no, I can't. So why the fuck would you train like that? It's just not a sustainable way of training to get really good results. So, so that's, that's the end run is really the recovery we know is different. And that's what really determines time courses anyway, not, not uh, muscle protein synthesis elevation. Yeah, that was a really good answer. I was going to go the, the recovery direction, but you beat me to the punch. So very, very nice. Nicely done. All right. That's it. That's 10 questions, but I want to lead Lorenzo Vrolix um, 4chan bullshit over here right below. Okay. So I'm always fascinated with this style of text or whatever because it gives off like alt-right 4chan gabber type vibes of like it's incredibly difficult to read and <laughs> It's like full of like innuendos and memes 
And it's so like doge gif internet culture that I'm barely keeping up. Like maybe I'm just old or some shit, but I just want to read this and see if we can follow along and how much I, sense I definitely feel you. Man, I yeah. can't even read Twitter. Twitter, I can't. I look at oh, it, I'm like, fuck no. It's like, gobbledygook. Hat, what is Hat, this? What's his name? Hat, I can't Hat, read it. Name? Like, you didn't say anything. Um, all right. Lorenzo says, uh, Arrow, bored in my clinical psychology lecture. Arrow, talking about how to identify borderline personality disorder. Arrow, my face when we're watching a video of Lyle McDonald. Uh does that mean they, they uh, watched that together in class? Or does that mean he saw it by himself? I think he's, I, I would interpret that as to like, he's making like maybe an eye roll face like he would when he's watching a, a video of Lyle McDonald. Like he's doing that in class. It's the same reaction he would get in his current class situation as he would when he was watching oh. a Lyle McDonald video. Right. That's, that's how I would look at that, I guess. Got it. Okay, cool. Uh, Arrow, notification goes off, get distracted, check phone. Arrow, new webinar from Mike and James. Oh, uh, subscriber. Arrow, yeah. That's right. Arrow, uh, excited.png. So a PNG files are a picture of the files or the GIFs or something like that. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's a picture of excitement. And then Arrow, no intro with Maddie Forberg. Arrow, slightly disappointed, loved her in Brute Strength series, a great display of general physical preparedness. Arrow, go through timestamps. Arrow, oh boy, a question about left tricep twitching. Arrow, call the boys. I what that means. It's the screw. Uh, yeah, I don't think he's calling anyway. They're, think do, they're doing webinar and chill. There's no way. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then Arrow, quote, Mike is going to do a story again for the umpteenth time about how he injured his triceps doing heavy rows and how he flexes. And now if he flexes his chest really hard, it will continue to flex for a few seconds after. And it uh, and nobody in existence uh, knows its cause. That's true. I've told that story a whole bunch. I'm glad you're tuning in, Lorenzo. Um, Arrow, my face when it doesn't happen. So, like, what is your face when it doesn't happen? I don't know. I, so I, I, I interpret. So I, I'm thinking that he's like he's like, oh, Mike's gonna go oh. through this story, right. and then but you didn't, didn't and he's like, oh, mm, oh I don't know. But, what, what is your? I want to know what emotion you were experiencing. Was it dis, what is it dissatisfaction? I Look, wanted. We're the early millennials. We need the emojis. You gotta yeah. at least. You gotta put a Look, smiley honey, face. I learned how to use emojis on my phone. <laughs> what, what is it? Which, I don't remember what the right word for it is. I call it the early millennial. Right? There's like the like yeah people who were born like in 1985 or 86 or whatever. That's us. Yeah. Yeah. 1980 to 1990. We're yeah. like, we know the internet, but like we were around without it as well. Uh, okay. Arrow go back and forth between timestamps to double check arrow. Notice James hair arrow is actually really nice. Oh, oh, oh thanks. So James, James's hair is actually really nice. Is that what, what that means? I hope so. Uh, everyone was all Mel's family was giving me shit when I like shaved off my my mohawk area. Yeah, arrow eight chan arrow incel <laughs> J.K. Lorenzo. <laughs> uh, oh boy, shots fired. Uh, well, thank you for that story. Um, God damn, the internet passed us by, James. We're the dupes here because every motherfucker probably reads this and was like, like oh, Lorenzo man. made a great point." And we're like, "What the fuck?" Hey, Mike, you remember zip disks? Hey, Mike, you remember Oregon Trail? Yes. <laughs> hey, Mike, do you remember whatever that shitty word processor was for the Macs that they made us use? In yes. School? And then you did, you did the cursor like this on paint, and then it would show up like, <laughs> like that because it would render like with a five-second delay. Absolutely. Hey, do you remember Math Blasters? Dude, I remember all that shit. <laughs> do you remember our objectively lower standard of living in every way describable? Because yeah. technology has made everything better. Yes. Yes. Did you ever play the like elementary school game, the Carmen San Diego game? Yes. Dude, I sucked at that game so bad. Geography is still my worst, you know, like sk skill. She'd be like, Hola, como estas? Where am I? I'm like, Cleveland? She's like, no, like, God damn Nobody's it. going to Cleveland, James. Nobody's ever She'd going to be Cleveland. like, oh, look, bienvenue. I have some wine and a baguette. Where am I now? I'm like, 
Akron? She's like, how do you know all these places in Ohio? God damn it, you suck. Why do you only know Ohio? You're like, all right, all right, all right. Cincinnati. <laughs> exactly, dude. I blew it that game. Oh, Carmen San Diego. Donde estas? Uh, you know. Oh, wow, you. Was she hot? So, like, me now would say yes, but me back then just didn't understand. She was she like a teacher's, teacher's age. Like, who's that lady from Modern Family? She was, she was, the, who's the wife, the hot wife from Modern Family? Yeah, Sofia Vergara. Not Sofia Vergara, yeah. That was her, that's the, the same person, basically, right? Yo, Carmen San Diego is fine as hell. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She's got like a new, like, a, she's like a cartoon character or whatever. What if Dora the Explorer becomes Carmen San Diego when she gets older? It's like a time time thing, like a Terminator thing. She's like, like still exploring, but she's now like, I'm so good at this shit, I'm gonna make y'all motherfuckers figure out where I am. Because usually she would just be like, hola, like I am here. Now she's like, where am I? Oh, bitch, exactly. Really no shit. Exactly. And then Carmen San Diego goes back in time to kill her earlier Dora self because of the Terminators. Somehow they're tied in. Q Matrix Freeway music. <laughs> I love. That. Okay, love that. I'm late to the party on something Matrix related, and I don't, I'm definitely not trying to stir the pot in any way. It's just me being ignorant. Wait, wait. <laughs> Arrow begins to stir pot. Am I doing it right? No, I had no idea the what what who I knew as the Wachowski brothers. I think are both trans now. Is that correct? I heard they were trans a long time ago. They were trans were they? before it was cool. Yeah. I had no idea. I was just, in my mind, they were always the Wachowski brothers. And then something came up with the Matrix and they were like, from the, I don't remember what they said and I don't want to get it wrong, but I was like, oh, that's weird. And then I was like, oh, that's, that's I had I no even, idea. I didn't even know what they look like and never Googled it and don't care one way or another because the God damn, you give us the Matrix? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, fucking Matrix the world is, sweet. is yours. Literally, heard, because the Matrix made it. Aren't they doing a, another a new one? I can't get excited about it, James. But I would love to if if mm. um, I don't want to get excited about it if I don't know if it's happening. Because like, <gasps> oh. I keep hearing like like rumors. I don't know if it's on my phone or what, but like all these like potential Keanu Reeves movies that keep that are like allegedly coming out. John Wick Five is being filmed at the same time as John Wick Four. Oh, sweet. <laughs> If Lawrence Fishburne better be out of these goddamn movies already. He made no sense. In three, I was like, all right, get out of here already. James, we've been friends for a long time, yeah? <laughs> I'm just going to tell you this. He's going to scold me. He's going to scold me, guys. Watch your fucking mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne. made no sense. You may know you make no sense, God damn it. He's like, I'm the king of the messenger pigeons. Yes. <laughs> I'm dead. That I'm made- not dead. <laughs> ah, I got you. I love it. That's so Lawrence Fishburne, though. It made more than enough sense for me. I was like, this made way more sense than The Matrix. Lawrence Fishburne, Lawrence Fishburne must be one of my favorite actors ever. If he's in anything, that movie, whatever, goes straight to hell because I'm just interested in Lawrence Fishburne <laughs> at that point. Like, if I was like in a movie and I was like a drug dealer picking up from Lawrence Fishburne, as soon as I walked into the scene, he'd be like, where's the stuff? I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, it's Lawrence Fishburne. And they're like, Mike, 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 pause. Okay. You have to call him by his actor name. I'm like, no character name. No. Like no, no, no. That's Lawrence Fishburne. You motherfuckers need to have some respect. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne, amazing. Made the whole fucking Matrix. Neo. Uh, yes. Uh, whoa. Get out of here. Lawrence amazing Fishburne. in the Matrix. Questionable in John Wick. Also amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. I think we're we gonna wasted wrap up. enough of everyone's time. <laughs> Thank you. And so that's going to be on the timestamp. It's going to be like seven minutes. Oh, yeah. Mike and James bullshit. You about know, Milo will put it in too. I know. I know. All right, folks. Uh, great questions this week. They were all really interesting as usual. Thanks for subscribing. Uh, we liked the extra little the story that we got there from that last person. That was fun. Um, keep submitting your questions. Keep upvoting questions that you like, and we'll do our best to get the ones that we think are the best. So, thanks again, and subscribe, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Peace, homies.